Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. So it's a pleasure to have two very important speakers this morning. One is the former Secretary of State of Interior of Austria. She was there from uh, 2017 to uh, 2019. And now she's chairing the anti-Semitism Working Group of the European Parliament. And the other one is one of the head of the Jewish conspiracy in the world, <laughs> because uh, he has been named most influential rabbi in America by Newsweek. So speaking of uh, the new forms, I mean, of anti-Semitism and how we should combat it, then, uh, I just want to make a first remark. The new forms of anti-Semitism have an impact on the life of Jews in the different countries where they live. We have now a number of issues the issues, I mean, used to be very much in Europe, and all our American friends always reminded us, I mean, how can you be a Jew in France? How can you be a Jew in Belgium, in Austria? I mean, it's, it's a huge problem. And speaking also of uh, the number of Jews leaving European countries to uh, resettle in Israel. But now also we see that it's not easy to be a Jew in certain universities in the US, you know, especially with the new form of anti-Semitism, which is anti-Zionism. So I would like to ask our guests, is anti-Zionism the only form of new anti-Semitism? And how would you fight it? Thank you very much and good morning everybody. I feel really honored not only to be a participant of this very important conference but also to be here on the panel with the very important rabbi in the US. I had already the opportunity to talk to you yesterday in death and so it's really a big honor for me. First of all, allow me a personal remark. I'm not Jewish and I do not have any ancestors uh, in Jewish culture or religion but I was kept and touched by this topic, also by the topic of fighting anti-Semitism, around 25 years ago. And that was when our professor in school took us to the synagogue in Salzburg. And already at that time, it was a very, very small community of about 25, 30 people. At the moment, I think there are seven to 10. And the guy, the rabbi, who was talking to us was Marco Feingold. Marco Feingold uh, was the eldest survivor of the Holocaust in Austria. He died on the 19th, 9, 2019, this year, at the age of 106. And to be honest, I was touched and also touched by the fact that his widow asked me to speak at his funeral. We had a very good relation. And it was that moment 25 years ago when I was preoccupied by this topic. I studied then law in Austria, in Salzburg. I became a criminal judge, and you already mentioned it. In the end, I also became state secretary responsible for the former concentration camp in Mauthausen, among other topics. And what I tried to do during this time is to bring th something um, at the agenda which can fight anti-Semitism. And in my opinion, the key is education. The key are the young people, the young generation. They don't have to learn in school, it's, not, it's not enough. They really have to feel it from their hearts, what was going on at that time. And my mother also was a German professor um, at a boarding school, and she took a lot of pupils to the former concentration camp of Mauthausen. And what we were very regularly discussing at home is that pupils were so touched when they were there. And what we want to give them is not a kind of guiltiness. They are not guilty for anything what happened in, in former years when they were not born. But they should think about these topics. And my mother always told me there were so many pupils, they came to her weeks after the visit in Mauthausen and they said, I felt so guilty and what can I do? I want to do something. And I, say, I don't say that's the solution for everything and that we can combat anti-Semitism to the end with this. But it's a very, very important key to make people aware of the problem, to make them aware of history, 
and somehow to strengthen them that they can figure out if there are some tendencies. When I was a state secretary at the very beginning, I think I became it in December and it was in February, there was a big conference in Vienna and it was called An End to Antisemitism. And Ariel Musikant, he was there, opened um, the conference and he said, there will never be an end to antisemitism. We always have to fight it and we have to fight it in all its form and it's a matter of fact that antisemitism is on the rise. And if I'm speaking of antisemitism, I mean all forms of antisemitism. There is the old one, very well and unfortunately known in Austria and Germany from the Nazi time. There is a new imported antisemitism from the refugees. And yeah, I think people in Israel are dealing with this form of antisemitism since uh, the existence of the state of Israel at least. But in, in Europe, it is new because many pupils are drinking anti-Semitism with the mother's milk. And that was exactly what Oskar Deutsch, the president of the Vienna Jewish community, said yesterday on the television. He always says it, he repeated it yesterday. We have to fight this new form, this imported anti-Semitism with education, to bring them awareness of our history. It's something different here than in Israel. But we have to be aware. And then there is the third form, the anti-Zionism. And this form, I think, is really harder to figure out because you have the freedom of expression, you have the freedom of, freedom of opinions, and that's a human right. I'm a human rights lawyer also. I was working at the European Court of, uh, the European Court of Human Rights for two years. But you have to make a distinction. The right of freedom of expression ends where you are touching other human rights. And Criticism is okay, but if criticism is not objective, if criticism turns out only against a state as such, then it's anti-Zionism, and this is also anti-Semitism. And it lasted a long time. It lasted a long time that we dared to express it very directly, but I say it very clearly, we have to fight all these forms, no matter where it comes from, we have to stand up to fight and be against all these forms because it's really destructive for our society. And allow me one last sentence. I was in Israel only two weeks ago with Elnet. It was my second term to Israel. I was also there one year before. And I figured out a clear other attitude now in, in the country. When I was there in October last year, it was interesting, I knew already a lot about the country, I was really touched, I, I, I'm a big fan of Israel, I want to come back as soon as possible. But this time, it was different, because all the MKs I met, for example, all the professors, all the people with, I, with whom I had discussion, said it very clearly, it's not the question if a new start, uh, war will start, it's only the question when. And that is alarming, and now we have to stand up as the European Union, Israel is our only democratic partner in this region and we have to support it because Israel really deserves it. Thank you. I'm tempted to just say yes, everything she said. Um, but I want to I wanna issue one caution and also say at least one positive thing since something encouraging ought to be said uh, at a conference that can be thought of as very discouraging in some ways. First, the caution is this, which is that there are obviously different strains of anti-Semitism. Speaking just in the United States, the anti-Semitism of the college campus is almost entirely the anti-Semitism of the left. The anti-Semitism that bombs synagogues so far in the United States has been almost entirely the anti-Semitism of the right. And then there is Islamic motivated anti-Semitism, which isn't properly speaking left or right, although it has more affinities in America with the left than with the right. The problem with this is, wherever someone stands on the political spectrum, they tend to ignore the anti-Semitism that comes from their side of the political spectrum. So supporters of Trump tend to downplay anti-Semitism of the right. People, especially on the left side of the Democratic Party, tend to downplay anti-Semitism of the left. People who are worried about the demonization of the Islamic community tend to downplay the anti-Semitism of the immigration from the Middle East. And all of them 
are enabling the anti-Semitism of their own side. It's almost as if you said, because I got cancer, heart attacks don't matter. And the truth is that anti-Semitism from every side has its own danger. And the fruitless debate about which is in fact the most dangerous at the moment, is not, it's not just a fruitless debate, it's a destructive debate. Because unless you fight it on all sides, you are giving tacit approval to the anti-Semitism that happens to be on, the, on the, your political, on the side of the politics that you approve of. And in the United States, this is an increasing problem because as, as political positions become hardened, to make any concession on your side of the political aisle seems to be giving the other side too much. So you never want to say, well, yes, on my side, there's also the haters, uh, unless you finish that sentence with, but theirs are worse. Because as we all know, whatever you say before the but doesn't matter, right? If the sentence is, yes, people on my side have a problem, but then you know that that first part of it doesn't matter. It, in fact, only matters what they're doing on their side. So that is a, a serious problem. Um, the delegitimization of Israel tends, happen, tends to happen mostly on the left. The more overt forms of anti-Semitism tend to happen on the right. Um, at least the left gives us, as La Rochefoucauld said, this hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue. At least the left have the decency to be hypocrites. Um, or you could say at least the right have the decency to be honest, depending on which side you prefer. But let me just say one encouraging thing, since I'm not even sure that the premise of the question, which is new forms of anti-Semitism is possible. I think anti-Semitism is as old as the hills, and though it mutates, I'm not sure there are new forms. Looking at the Christian community in the 21st century, anyone has to say, that the change in the general Christian view, especially in the United States, but also worldwide, of Judaism has been dramatic and, ha and in ought to be acknowledged as a sea change of attitudes, starting at the head of the Catholic Church for the last 50, 60 years, but also running through American Protestantism very powerfully and other aspects of uh, Christian life. Remember that for most of Jewish history, after the early Middle Ages, Christianity was the major enemy of the Jewish people. That's no longer true. And the fact that that's no longer true shouldn't be ignored because as we sit here and say, we have to fight anti-Semitism, but we will never win, we should also remember that there have been large swaths of anti-Semitic populations that are no longer anti-Semitic in any real sense. And if you don't have hakarat tov, if you don't actually feel thankful for the things that are good, then you're going to be just constantly spewing jeremiads at all the things that are terrible in the world. And the people who help you will say, to what end do we help you if you don't recognize that our help has, uh, has been both real and really salutary and made a difference. Israel is not friendless in the world and the Jewish people are not friendless in the world and we should remember that. There is a huge difference between the US and Europe, which is in the US the full freedom of speech. And in Europe we have many laws against racism, anti-Semitism, and even now I mean, a new definition of anti-Semitism that is being yes. Uh, on board it and which helps fighting. I mean, how do you fight in the US? Also, your food is better. <laughs> there are large differences in many areas. Of, um, in the US, the, the most effective way to fight is public opinion and the ballot box. I mean, it's true, for example, if you go to our synagogue, and I'm proud to say that many of our members are here. Yes, you will have guards, and you will have metal detectors, and you will have all sorts of security, primarily because we have a large school associated with the synagogue. But that isn't the primary way people fight anti-Semitism. The primary way is through that freedom of speech. The primary way is through opposing any candidates that seem dangerous, by standing up and, and, and speaking about it, by having demonstrations, um, 
That's the principal way, and also, uh, to some extent, and I'm not sure how much this is effective in Europe, by public shaming. A public figure cannot be successful in the United States if they are credibly accused of anti-Semitism. Um, once they are, they have to backtrack, backpedal, prove that in fact they're not anti-Semitic. They can't lean into it. If they do, their public career is over. In Europe, uh, Corbyn has sort of had it both ways. Corbyn could not exist effectively, I think, as a public figure in the United States. He by now would have been gone. One more question to, to you. I mean, do, uh, there are a number of churches now that are very, uh, very much in favor of Israel and helping yes. a lot. At the same time, a number of others, I mean, being also in favor of Israel, have some issues, internal issues with the Jews. And how is it, I mean, how is it, how can you fight against it without antagonizing them completely? Well, it depends which churches. I mean, there are churches that are fairly, um, there's something called KUFI, Christians United for Israel. Um, some people are suspicious of them because Jews and fundamentalist Christians don't see eye to eye about a number of things. Um, I've spoken in a couple of churches where KUFI has a presence And I must say, it's a remarkable thing to walk into a Latino church in Compton and have them greet you with, hey, venu shalom aleichem. Um, it's really quite something. What I would say is that Jews, like anyone else, are allowed to make strategic alliances. I don't have to agree with you about everything in order for me to agree with you about Israel. And, and I, when, when people ask me about the theological question, I give them one of two answers. First of all, the truth is, I don't care what you think happens to me after I die. As long as you treat me well when I'm alive, we'll worry about the afterlife when the afterlife comes. <laughs> and I, I, I said, I in fact said to the church, one of the churches, when they asked me about the Messiah, I told them what Martin Buber said. Martin Buber is a great Jewish philosopher, spent the end of his life in Israel. He said, I think Jews and Christians should stop arguing about the Messiah until he comes. When he comes, they should say to him, excuse me, have you been here before? <laughs> If the Messiah is as smart as I think he is, said Buber, he'll go, you know, I don't remember. <laughs> so I don't know that they agreed with Buber's conclusion, but, but it diffused the, the messianic question for a while. Thank you. How would you fight state antisemitism? Like, for example, the Iranian one, you know, they make every year their very nice competition about anti-Semitic cartoons, for example. I think we have to start the fight earlier because it's uh, very much about society, how society thinks, how society is aware of the problem. And with the, your last question, I would like to reflect on that you touched somehow my field of criminal law because I think it's really a precondition to have a definition of anti-Semitism to be able to fight it in, in terms of a lawyer, in terms of a judge. And that's something uh, we did during the Austrian presidency of the, European Council, uh, of the Council of the European Union in the second half of 2018. We really do have now a binding definition of anti-Semitism. And then a, a second thing comes into play. It's not enough to have law which says it's forbidden to make anti-Semitic uh, phrases, to make caricatures in this way. But we also have to find really severe penalties if there is something happening. And that's what I'm missing. And I give you only an example. I also was the head of the task force penal law, but we dealt with um, sex sexual harassment and, and physical harassment against women and children, not excluding the men, but we know that 80% of the victims are women. And I was somehow targeted, they, they, they attacked me because they said, why do you want to have more severe penalties and it's enough what is there and that doesn't help the, help the victims. I think society have to make a statement and if the law is not there and if it's there but not um, done, justice must, must also be done, then it doesn't help. Society has the opportunity 
and also the responsibility to stand up and the state has to support that. So if there are no penalties, it says something about the society. It says that it's okay, that there's a law, but this was not that hard enough. We, we couldn't bring him before, judge, uh, before, before the court. And, and that's the, the, the real problem. And, and if society is not that self-confident, then the state will also influence uh, the society. So it's vice versa, I guess. And, and that's why I say education is the key and the state has the responsibility to fulfill its task. It's, not, it, it's a really hard question for me what we could do, for example, with uh, Iran or Hezbollah in, 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 in Lebanon. But uh, I think there are movements now which show that they are not happy with, with their regime. And there we have to take them and to support them and to give them the confidence to stand up. Thank you. Maybe just, I mean, one view, I mean, before we end the panel, uh, I would like to see from both of you, I mean, what is your view? I mean, is it an optimistic view or a pessimistic view on how to, I mean, are we going to succeed in finding anti-Semitism, not to make it disappear, but to find it in a, in a very positive, I mean, a very positive and assertive manner? I'm a very optimistic um, person, otherwise I couldn't sur survive in politics. Um, I think we did already a lot because I was asked only a few days ago by, by a friend of mine, some of uh, you know her, Hannah Lessing, and she, and she asked me, what did we wrong? Why is it still there? Why do we have these anti-Semitic tendencies? And I said, I don't think that we did something wrong the last years because we did a lot and I think we succeeded also a lot because we had a study in Austria in March 2018 and it says that there is still a 10% old anti-Semitism. That's too, too much, that's much too much, but that's less than it was before and there's the ten tendency that it is going back. So we, we could succeed something. <laughs> and I have the impression, when we are following the line, working with pupils, bringing together young people, the young generation, I had also a very interesting talk yesterday on this topic. My vision somehow is to bring together pupils from Austria, from Israel, and from the United States, searching their roots in Israel, in Austria, in Germany, wherever, to try to understand that all the pupils all over the world have somehow the same problems, the same disputes, the same adult crisis or um, ad adolescence crisis, as my son, by the way, he's 18, he has it too, but there is a difference. If you're living in the European Union, you have peace but it's not God-given. If you're looking to Israel, the guys, the young guys and girls have to go to the, and serve in the military service. And they are not serving as the Austrians do it because it's half a year and they are interested in and maybe they could go on a mission far ab abroad from Austria, but they are serving in Israel because they have to defend their country with their lives because there are some countries surrounding Israel who want to destroy this state. And that's the big difference. And I have the impression, if we are bringing together young people, their young generation, without pointing our fingers on them, that they are guilty for anything or should feel guilty for their grandparents, maybe, then we can look into a good future and then we can maybe have something like heart openers for the world and also for a better world. So I, too, am an optimistic person by nature, but I don't think that actually you're permitted to be optimistic about anti-Semitism. You are permitted to be hopeful, and the difference is optimism assumes everything will work out. Hopeful assumes that people can do things that will make it better. I don't think it will work out by itself. Um, Maurice Samuel, who was a, a Yiddish-English writer, used to say that the reason nobody likes the Jews is no one likes their alarm clock. Right? The Jews awaken the conscience of the world. That's an unpleasant thing. It happens over and over again, and I'm not optimistic that that will change. Um, but I am hopeful that the, just as the virus of hatred can spread, so can the virus of goodness spread. And that we see happen in societies from time to time. And so um, since I'm the only rabbi on the panel, I'm, I'm going to close with a rabbinic story. Uh, about a young man who looks up at the heavens and he says, God, there's so much pain and suffering 
and anguish in your world, why don't you send help? And God says, I did send help. I sent you. So that's what I would say to you. Whether we can be hopeful is largely dependent on you. No, we can't be optimistic, but there is hope, and this conference is a beautiful illustration of it. So thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you. So our boss, <laughs> Il Capo de Tutti Capi, is asking us if you have questions. General. If, if I have a question to both uh, members of the panel. First, uh, to uh, MEP Stadler, uh, you didn't actually answer the question about Iran. And, uh, and the fact is that it's not only, not only Europe that actually ignores Iran's anti-Semitism, uh, even the United States, when you look at the 12 points of Pompeo, one point is missing. There's no reference of the anti-Semitism of Iran. So why is it that we, again, in the same situation, we see a rising power getting closer and closer to a nuclear weapon, and still we don't do anything about its anti-Semitism. Well, this is not a, a nuclear weapon like the case of, I don't know, North, even North Korea. It's, it's something that is made for a purpose. And the second question is for, for you, Rabbi. You said in the United States, a politician cannot survive if he is uh, seen as an anti-Semite. didn't quite say it that way, but go ahead. OK, you'll correct me if I uh, mis, uh, misquoted you. Uh, but look. It's not only Ilan Omar and uh, Rashid Atlaib who use the new anti-Semitism. Even Bernie Sanders is blaming Israel of being racist. And they not only survive, but uh, he's competing to become the Democratic Party uh, candidate. So is it, is it still the case, or is the situation changing? I? OK, sure. Uh, yeah, I was, I was actually hearing the, the Ilhan Omar challenge as I was saying that. What I said was someone like Corbyn. Um, Corbyn, who eulogizes Hamas and Hezbollah leaders, such a thing couldn't happen. And, and by the way, I don't know how much you're aware of how much Ilan Omar and Rashida Talib have to take back afterwards because of social pressure as a result of it, which never would have happened in Europe. Um, and and Sanders, Sanders, is a, it, Sanders is a complicated case. Sanders is of the old left. I think it's a very hard case to say that Sanders is anti-Semitic. It is not a hard case to say that I think anybody who supports Israel does not want to see Sanders anywhere near the White House. Um, I, I would suspect that we don't have many Sanders supporters here. Um, but, but an overt, unapologetic anti-Semitism, which you do not get not even in Ilhan Omar, who comes as close to the line as she can, but she knows what she can't cross. An overt, unapologetic anti-Semitism cannot survive in political life in America. That's why you get coded anti-Semitism. That's why you get people, don't forget that Ilhan Omar I not only had to apologize, but then she consulted with all these Jewish friends and they came out with statements and others. She had to cover herself specifically because if you don't do that, you get killed, which is not to say that Ilhan Omar isn't anti-Semitic. I, I don't have any question about it. I've even written about that. But that she would make anti-Semitic statements is a very different thing from being anti-Semitic. She's very careful about what she says and what she doesn't say, precisely because she knows she can signal, but if she goes too far, she's going to get killed. So I agree with you to the extent that can you be an anti-Semite and succeed in American public life? Yes. Can you make anti-Semitic statements and succeed in American public life? No. And that's not true in Europe. It may be a distinction without a difference, but, but it actually, it's the hypocrisy distinction that matters. That is, American public opinion will not allow you to succeed if they can't credibly make the case that you're not anti-Semitic. Look what happened to Jesse Jackson. I don't know if you remember that destroyed his political career because he said Jaime Town. He apologized a hundred times, didn't matter. And he's not the only one. So there is a difference, but I agree that it bears watching. And after only one more question, because we ran out of time. Yeah. So 
coming from Austria, having served as a state secretary under Sebastian Kurz, um, who is a big fan and a big supporter of Israel, I, I am very clear in my statement, and I, I mentioned it also, I, I think Israel deserves all the support it needs. So, and now we are coming to Iran. I was there two weeks ago. I was uh, visiting a tunnel which was built from Lebanon to Israel. Uh, I understood that Hezbollah is uh, financed and, and supported by Iran, and that Iran is one of the biggest enemies of Israel who wants to destroy this, this state. So, in my opinion, the European Union has to change its attitude regarding this conflict. There have to be more pressure, there have to be san sanctions. The big fear in Europe, as I understood it, and I'm a MEP since uh, July this year, and I'm following very closely regarding this topic since, since that time, but also before, um, the big fear of Europe is the nuclear weapon thing. And I, I have the impression Europe tried to solve this problem by discussing. But now, we should change our attitude because we see that it's not fulfilling its task in this way. There have been more pressure. And what I can do, I will do in supporting Israel, in bringing another attitude to the European Union every day of my work. I just want to say one thing about Iran very fast that I believe I first read in Alan Finkelrod, the, the French philosopher. He said that Iran threatens the two great taboos of the 20th century, the Holocaust and Hiroshima, all at once, right? I mean, there has never been a threat like that. It is to destroy the Jewish people with a nuclear bomb so that the world is not reacting more frantically is is astonishing and dispiriting. Okay. Paweł Kuglasz, I'm a lawyer in Poland. I work at the University in Krakow. I have a question to Mrs. Stadler. We discussed yesterday the really possibility to work together against anti-Semitism because what you mentioned, there are many newspapers, they are anti-Christian and anti-Semitic. And do you see a possibility that in the education, especially of lawyers, the question of anti-Semitism should be included because what we listened yesterday, that in France there's a problem with the prosecutor to understand the definition of anti-Semitism. That is why especially lawyer at the universities, prosecutor, attorney should learn about anti-Semitism and you see a possibility that the European Union and the EU group can support such initiative. And one uh, additional uh, mention. Two weeks ago, uh, it was a very important declaration signed between the uh, Jewish community in the initiative of Steinberg and Pope against euthanasy. That is why we have really common value and we should and could work together. Thank you very much. I, I fully second what you said. Of course, training of judges, of prosecutors is needed. It's more needed than it's done now. Uh, I heard it also yesterday from the minister in France here that it, it's mandatory here in France. We also launched programs for judges, for trainee judges, to visit Mauthausen, to have some workshops and so on, to better understand. But yeah, we could do more, and it should be mandatory for everyone, because if you know more about the topic, if you were there, if you felt the security situation, the history from the bottom of your heart, you will never file a judgment or not filing an accusation because it's nothing. So that's the, the key also for these professions to more and learn more about it. So I fully account that. We started it already, but we have to really broaden it for all uh, trainee judges and also the judges acting. Thank you very much.